We're going to take a look at one of the most common obstacles we encounter in getting a, a burner and, and boiler piece of equipment running, and, and that's pilot problems. To light the main burner, we've got to first establish a pilot uh, in order and verify it to safely open the main fuel valves and, and get the show on the road. Um, but pilots can be finicky, and there are a few things that are critical. And the three most important things are that we have a heat source or ignition, we've got fuel, and we've got air. And each of those things has certain challenges that uh, come along with them. So um, when we try to light a burner, um, we've got a pilot solenoid, we've got a pilot regulator, we've got an ignition transformer, we've got an air source, and we've got a scanner. So we're going to look at and kind of break these down and look at each aspect. Um, we need all those things, but we're going to start with a spark. So our ignition voltage comes from an ignition transformer, and these can deteriorate over time. So if our ignition transformer gets weak and doesn't generate a sufficient spark, then we won't light a pilot. Um, the easiest way to verify that that is still functioning correctly is to use uh, a spark plug tester. And I'm gonna set that up so we can see how that works. So the health of an ignition transformer is determined basically by its secondary voltage or indirectly the length of the spark because if we've got a transformer that can only generate a spark that'll jump an eighth or sixteenth of an inch, we don't have a reliable gap, we don't have a reliable spark. So I've got this spark plug tester from an auto parts store, and what it allows me to do is safely wire this up in such a way that I can actually gauge the length of the spark that can be created by the transformer. I've seen this done other ways with channel locks and, and holding that ignition wire and, and playing with it, but there's a lot better chance of getting shocked doing it that way um, by jumpering the sub base from power to the ignition output and closing my pilot gas valves. I can simply apply power and measure that spark jump. And I want a spark that can easily jump a quarter inch probably farther to ensure that we've got a good healthy transformer that can do the job. So let's check this out. So what that tells us is that if we've got a quarter inch spark, then any gap between our electrode and the grounding surface inside the pilot, if it's less than a quarter inch, we're going to successfully generate a spark. Once we verify that we're generating a healthy spark, the next important thing is to make sure that that spark within the pilot arrangement is occurring where it's designed to be. So we want to inspect the wiring going to our igniter. We want to make sure we don't have wear or rubbing or burn marks on this because as you can see, it could rub across that brass and uh, degrade the insulation, we could get an ignition spark here. Well, we don't have any fuel there, so that's not going to be successful. So eventually we've got to look within the pilot assembly itself. And the key to any pilot assembly is making sure that we've got that spark arranged the way that the manufacturer intended. So if we look at this, um, we can see that the spark igniter is centered on the gas spud and we can actually see carbon in there as a result of that being fuel rich at the spark. And that carbon to me tells me that I don't have a great mixture at the spark, so it reduces the likelihood of successful light off. But we can also get carbon bridging or threading between the electrode and the surface. So this igniter, based on the manual diagram, should actually be rotated so that it's not arcing off of the fuel spud in there, but actually off the bottom housing. So it should be an eighth of an inch off of the bottom metal plate. And the depth is also important um, because they obviously designed these with some intent. So refer to the manual on your burner to make sure you've got that pilot assembly in the right location. 
And, and frankly, if you've got a reliable pilot, it's not bad to take that opportunity to pull the pilot assembly, take some internal photos, and make sure when it's working, you know, we can see what that looks like. So that if somebody yanks or moves or if the part gets loose, we can reorient it back to that factory spot. If we continue to have trouble getting a proper spark, we may want to actually remove the igniter and verify we don't have any cracking in the porcelain because that'll generate a path uh, for the electricity to go to a different spot within the pilot assembly or in the mounting that, that's unintentional. Also, over time, especially if a boiler cycles a lot, this electrode length may shorten. Um, or we may get a new electrode and it might not be exactly right. So I found that these electrode adjustment tools, which are designed to really neatly fit on the electrode, give me the ability to very precisely bend or reshape the electrode as needed. We can do this job with uh, linesman's pliers or, or channel locks, but you get a lot more finesse and better angles and, and we can bend it with more intentionally with these little crown ignition adjusters. We can verify in some cases that we've got a good spark just by looking from the rear sight port on the burner. So if we can look in there and we see a spark, a uh, blue spark usually indicates that there's plenty of air at the spark. If we've got a very dull or orange spark, it could indicate that we've got too much gas pressure on the pilot which could cause the pilot to, to run rich and, and soot like we saw on that other pilot assembly. Um, when we're running or when we're setting up our pilot, we do want to make sure that we've got the right gas pressure and that we've got ga gas pressure at all. And the tools we use to provide that are a pilot regulator and a pilot solenoid. The pilot solenoid is going to energize at the pilot moment of ignition and our regulator is going to ensure that we have the correct pressure to the pilot. Now burner manuals will typically give you a range for proper pilot gas pressure. But one of the biggest mistakes that we see is if somebody has a random pilot failure, one of the first things they'll do is crank down that regulator to give it more gas. And that's not always the right direction to go because we, we can actually have too much gas to have a reliable pilot. So it needs to be set correctly. And we can verify that pilot pressure with a manometer. So we're going to run this. When we get to the pilot ignition phase, I'm going to lock it in test. And we can look at that pressure. And I'll move the pilot uh, regulator in and out to see uh, what the spring range essentially is. And, and generally what I will do if I've got a nuisance pilot is I will test it until I see where the high end is where I have problems and I'll run it with very little gas until I see where I start to lose flame signal and I'll try to split that difference because I feel like that gives me the best margin for error on both sides. So I'm going to lock this in pilot and we can look at that pressure as I adjust it. So I've got this locked in test and I can see I'm at right about 1.9 inches. I've got a five volt flame signal, so that seems like it lit immediately and is reliable. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and drive the regulator through the range and see if my flame signal uh, is equal throughout. So when I get that gas pressure below an inch, I start seeing my flame signal drop in, drop out. And that may mean that that pilot's not large enough to wrap around and get in front of the scanner, but it also may not be reliable for light off. Now I've moved it to 4.6 inches, which has given me a lot more pilot gas. And I've got a good flame signal, but what I don't know is whether or not it would light off reliably at that pressure. So I'm going to restart it and we'll witness that. So it did light with the max gas pressure on it, but that doesn't ensure that that's going to be reliable in the long term. 
And, and one reason that high gas pressure can be a problem at the pilot is because we may, we may only have an instant when the spark comes on that we have the right mixture. And if it doesn't light at, at that moment, if it has too much gas pressure, it may not light at all. So there's a test we can do called the pilot flood test. And what we'll do is we'll let the solenoid energize without the ignition transformer powered and we'll apply the spark five seconds into the pilot. And if we've got too rich of a mixture, it actually won't light um, at that moment. So what we want is a gas air mixture that will uh, reliably light it at any moment in the 10 second pilot trial. So if we've got too much gas, it's only got a very small window to be successful and that's not the best for reliability. So I'm going to use this method to jump power to the transformer. I've interrupted with uh, a pair of alligator clips and this will allow me to apply power at the five second mark on the pilot trial. And if we get a flame signal right away, then our pilot's not flooded. If we don't, then that indicates that the gas that we've got is excessive for reliable light off. So apparently, even with the higher gas pressure, we're getting a reliable light off five seconds into introducing gas. So our pilot's not flooding in this case, but I've encountered many times where on the high end of the regulator output, we can have such a, an amount of gas in there that the spark just generates carbon and not a flame in its attempt to light off. So the PowerFlame C-Burner manual recommends that on in low fire and the light off position that the air damper be a quarter inch open because based on their engineering that should give us the right amount of air to have a stable pilot and also sufficient air to operate at the low fire input. And it's one thing to set this um, before we fire and verify that it's a quarter inch, but Sometimes we have pilot problems and it may be because an end switch in the mod motor is making too soon driving to low fire and the pilot trial will start before the air damper gets to that quarter inch position. So if we have pilot reliability issues, what we want to do is watch it go through the cycle and we want to verify that our pilot solenoid isn't energizing, we're not getting that ignition while we're still farther open than that. We want it to just have very little movement once that pilot um, starts. And if, and if we are starting too soon, we need to uh, have the low fire end switch adjusted to get us more reliability. Because basically we may be open too far and as we go through the pilot time, it may get to the correct position. So we may be squandering half of our optimal scenario for light off. So we can watch that. One reliable way to tell when the ignition comes in is to just lay your hand on the solenoid valve and you'll feel that snap or look for your pilot ignition indication on the panel. So we can watch that. If we're not seeing the pilot gas pressure, any gas pressure or an incorrect gas pressure, um, our regulator can be an issue. If it's not regulating correctly, it's one thing. But the other thing that sometimes happens with these is they sit. So if this burner sits all weekend and you turn it on on Monday morning, this diaphragm and, and valve have been in the closed position all weekend. Sometimes we'll have failures because the regulator's just gotten sticky. And so we may have a flame failure the first time we try to light it every Monday morning. And if we reset it and let it go through again, um, it works fine. Um, and in that case, I just recommend replacing the regulator. It's not an expensive device, but if we get moisture in there or it gets gummed up, it can really become one of those intermittent problems that, that drives you crazy. If the solenoid doesn't open, you won't have any pressure. 
or you only have pressure that you're see, seeing from the fan. So the first thing is we can use a non-magnetized screwdriver to verify that it is being energized and we can feel that pulling on the screwdriver tip. Um, but secondly, we get, we get that manometer or gauge downstream and verify that, boom, we are getting that gas pressure. If the solenoid fails open, we may have a flooded pilot situation where it's got gas going into the pilot all the time and we also don't have a reliable startup. So just a couple things to look at there. Regardless of the quality of our pilot and the reliability of our pilot, if we don't see the pilot with our scanner, um, we're not going to continue, we're not going to get a flame signal, we're not going to energize the main fuel valves. So it's an important maintenance item to pull the scanner and inspect it. And we can do that while it's firing and force the shutdown on the burner. Um, that's not a bad test to do. But what we want to do is look at the scanner and verify that it's clean. Um, in addition to the scanner being clean, the sight tube has to be open as well and it has to have a good view of the flame. Um, we can hardly put our head in there and see anything, but thanks to modern technology, um, we can use the camera and our iPhone and look right down there um, when we're going to light off. So if we can't see the flame through the tube, there's no way the scanner is going to be able to. If we verified the spark, we've verified the gas, we've done a visual on the pilot flame itself, but we're not getting a proper response from our scanner, um, we've cleaned the scanner and that doesn't seem to, to do the trick, uh, we could have a defective scanner. And, and honestly, it's not a bad part to have a uh, spare on hand because it's easy to change out if you need to, and, and that's a safe, reliable way um, to verify that it's not the issue. Um, if we've got a good scanner that's verified, um, the amplifier card as well. We need to make sure that it is the proper amplifier. So in this case, we've got an ultraviolet scanner, we've got an ultraviolet amplifier. We know those are matched. If we've got uh, a new scanner and we're still not getting a flame signal, even though we can visually see it, we're probably gonna change out the amplifier. And one thing that I recommend if you've got multiple pieces of equipment that have the same devices, you can simply swap an amplifier from one piece of equipment to another and not have to buy a new part to verify um, or to, 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 to guarantee that that's the issue before buying another one. 